NFL lead writer for the Bleacher Report. Matt, I hope you are doing well. Welcome inside the game here in Tuscaloosa. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Let's talk about these Alabama guys. Let's talk about the locks for the first round. Who are the locks for being in the first round from Alabama? Well, it's, it's tough to call anyone a lock anymore in the NFL, but uh, I think you could start with Reggie Ragland uh, as a lock. And I know a lot of teams see him differently. I think he's a lock for round one. Sean Robinson, lock for round one. Uh, I, I would think at this time, Jerron Reed, um, maybe not a lock, but definitely a, a guy who, you know, you're going to talk about him as a late first, early second. I would say the same for Ryan Kelly as well. So it's a, another good year for Alabama, no surprise. So Ron Kelly slipping in the back door in that first round? I wouldn't be surprised. You know, with me, you know, places like Seattle, Denver, uh, I think there are enough teams, even Carolina with Ryan Khalil getting older. I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if he does. You know, it's not a great center class. I think Ryan Kelly is a pretty special one. So if he if he's there at, at you know thirty or thirty one, I wouldn't be surprised if he does make this land in the first round. When you look at Reggie Raglan right now, how much did he improve his stock by coming back one more year? You know, I'm not sure if he actually did improve his stock all that much. Uh, I, I mean, it always helps put more game film out there, but the things that teams are going to question about Raglan are the same. You know, is he athletic enough? Is he a difference maker on defense, or is he? And I'm using air quotes here. Is he just uh, a run stopper? You know, does he just impact the game on first and second down? So, I guess he did show a little bit more on tape this year of playing in coverage, playing up the edge, rushing the quarterback a little bit. But I would say if you had questions about Raglan heading into 2015, you're probably wondering the same thing right now as you're kind of stacking your board. When you look at Derrick Henry, and trust me, we've had the criticism here. I mean, this time last year, right here on this show, we were questioning if he could be a feature back in the SEC. He proved us wrong. Do you think he can prove those people on draft day uh, wrong? And, and do you think he'll, he'll be have some success in the NFL? I hope he can prove people wrong because I'm one of his biggest doubters. So I hope so. Like that, That's legitimately one of my favorite things when a player proves me wrong as success. But, I mean, there are a lot of things working against him. You know, the precedent of running backs that size in the modern NFL, she's not very many of them. I, I did a quick study the other day of running backs over 245 pounds who led the NFL in rushing. And you have to go back to like Jerome Bettis. You know, I mean, it's it's a long time. So uh, the numbers don't work out well for him. But I mean, he's he's definitely a talented athlete. Um, it's just a matter of does he have the lateral quickness to find to find holes because they're going to be a lot smaller in the NFL than they were at Alabama. And also, you know, does he bring any value on third down because that's super important to the NFL right now. You have to be able to block. You have to be able to catch. And I know there's some some highlights of him blocking, but I thought overall he was not a very good pass blocker. So there's a lot of things that, that are kind of holding him back a little bit. Obviously the production was fantastic. He does have good long speed for a guy who's 247 pounds, but the short area quickness, you know, he has to do a better job of not going down on first contact. If you're that big, you should be running folks over in the backfield, and that's something I didn't see enough of. You know, I've had a couple of NFL players uh, that are, they're currently playing in the league who told me that they thought Kenyon Drake would have a better career at the next level than Derrick Henry. You would, would you agree with that, that? Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me at all. It, it really wouldn't because Drake does more of those things that the NFL wants. He catches the ball well. He can split him out wide. He blocks from the backfield. He might not be as powerful or he might not even be a straight line fast, but he's quicker. And sometimes the NFL quickness is just as important for running backs as speed. You know, like Jamal Charles, everyone knows has great long speed, but guys like Le'Veon Bell, who are just you know shifty, quick, they can get in and out of space, Like that is, is just as important as any other quality for a back. So you look at, at Drake, you know, four 4-4-5 speed. I, I thought he did very well at the combine in terms of the drills that he was asked to run. And he is big enough, I and mean, he's almost 6'1", he's 210 pounds. Like, that's a good size running back in the NFL. We are talking right now to Matt Miller. It is BleacherReport.com. He's a great analyst. Uh, when you look at an NFL insider, when you look at evaluating, projecting uh, talent as far as the NFL draft, uh, let me ask you about an evaluation. As we see college football changing, the up-tempo offenses, the quarterback option read, see a lot of programs running that right now. How tricky does that make it for NFL teams and even yourself when you're trying to evaluate, evaluate talent for the next level? Uh, it makes it really hard, and um, you know I've been doing this job at Blue Report for five years, so I've kind of seen the rise of the spread offense during 
to start my time in the media, and it, it makes it harder. I think the big thing is you really have to focus on traits and not production because, like, you know, quarterbacks are the one position everyone wants to get right. You can't get sucked into yards and touchdowns and interceptions because a lot of times the scheme is dictating those things, not the player's talent. So you really have to be focused in on what the individual player can do. And it, it does make it tougher. It makes it harder to evaluate quarterback because they're not making second and third reads. You know, they're, they're reading a poster board on the sideline that tells them where to throw the ball. That's not an NFL football. It makes it harder to evaluate a left tackle because he's never in a three-point stance. He rarely helps in the run game. They they just, you know, they have these very upright, not even, I don't even know if you call them athletic pass sets, but that's why a team like Alabama or Michigan, uh, LSU, like, that's why they're a little bit easier to evaluate, and it's part of the reason why, I think ultimately recruiting is going to swing back because kids are going to college now to go to the NFL. You know, you're not going to Alabama anymore to play there for four or five years, get your degree, and win a national title. You're trying to go to the NFL. And if you want to be an NFL quarterback, right now you're going to Michigan or, or you're, you know, you're going to maybe Virginia Tech now that Justin Fuente is there. But, like, you're, you're going to these places that can develop pro-level passers. And I, I do think that, uh, obviously, Alabama is a different animal, but we're going to see a swing back to where those, those pro-style teams are, are going to get back on top. Matt, do you, and this may sound like a really Homer in the tank type question, but when you're evaluating an NFL scouts and, and, and leaders inside that war room, do they, do they put a little, like, do you get a little bit of a brownie point because you played in a Nick Saban era, uh, oh, excuse me, for a Nick Saban football team where you have to have that intellectual ability to play the game? Does that give you anything, a boost, when they're looking at you? It, it definitely does, and I, I think at certain positions it really does. Like, if you play on the front seven and defense for Nick Saban, that's going to help. Now, if you play corner, it might hurt a little bit because the Alabama corners haven't transitioned very well to the NFL. So it, it definitely... You want to condition yourself, and like one of my favorite things is to scout the player, not the helmet. But you definitely like it's always in the back of your mind. It's like a Wisconsin running back. It doesn't matter how good that guy looks at college. the The rate of success is so low for those players in the NFL that I think you can start to worry about it a little bit. So on the on the flip side of that, yeah, you know if you if you are playing under Nick Saban or you're playing for Jim Harbaugh or you know, even Urban Meyer, it's going to give you a little bit of a boost for sure. A lot of people are asking why not Jacob Coker. What do you do? You like Jacob Coker as a quarterback in the National Football League? I know he's a project. He's going to be a lot of things to work out in that delivery. The mechanics are not great, but what do you see in Jacob Coker at the next level? Well, I, I never like to rule anyone out because you know you have these seventh round prospects now and sixth round prospects who are all becoming starters. So when I look at Coker, I, I try to focus more on like okay, what does he need to fix to, to start in the NFL? And obviously he has the size. I think he definitely has enough arm to do it. Um, what I saw over the past year and at the Senior Bowl was just very inconsistent. And you mentioned the mechanics. like That's the biggest thing. He has to be the same all the time. And you know, I think he's very robotic at times, which makes his, you know, all his, his release, it makes his footwork, it makes everything slow and heavy. So he's got he's to speed everything up. And, you know, you talk about being a rhythm passer. Some people think that's a bad thing. I actually think it's a good thing because you – your three-step drops always the same. Your five-step drops always the same. And I think for Coker, that's a lot of it. He just needs to speed up that process. And obviously, the guy only started what a year, um, so there's not a whole lot of tape out there to say, oh, he can or can't do it. But um, he definitely has the traits. It's just getting in a situation where he needs to be a number three quarterback for a little while and sit and learn and, and try to get with a, a guy who knows how to coach quarterbacks up a little bit. When you look at his mechanics and you look at him as a, as evaluation, does that give you or does that give Lane Kiffin more credit and Nick Saban more credit for what they were able to do here in Tuscaloosa with him? I think so. Yeah, I mean the NFL still cares about wins. You know, I mean you, you call any NFL scout right now and ask him about Jason Coker, the person that says, "Oh, it can win." You know, he plays, he's played in some big moments, so you can watch him play. You know, in in the playoffs, you can watch him play in a championship game and see how he does. You, Jared Goff might be the number two pick in the draft. You can't see him do that. So it, it's always going to be one of those areas that can definitely help a player. That they've been, especially at quarterback, like that's where it's so huge to have played under the light and in the biggest spotlight because you know how the player handles pressure now. Just a, a random question. I know you really covered the NFL draft, but also the NFL lead writer. 
What do you think about AJ McCarron at Cincinnati? You think he could be a starter in the next league, at that league? Well, yeah, I do, and I know he definitely thinks so too. Uh, he's one of the more more confident guys you're going to run into in the NFL. I, I think the biggest thing for him is uh, learning what he can and can't do with the ball. I think that's something we saw this year with Cincinnati. Was you know he came in that first game, and I think the speed was something he had to adjust to, but. I really thought he, he improved as he played more. And, you know, I wouldn't have been surprised if he was going to come in and, and you know, do some things for them because it looked like it was clicking for him the more the more he played. So I thought he did a good job of finding the open man. Uh, I thought he did a good job of handling protection. Now, uh, I'm not in the huddle. I don't know what they did you know, once he got in the game, if they changed the game plan or anything. But I was pretty impressed with how he did. And it, it's going to be interesting to see because he is behind an established starter in Andy Dalton. How many, how many looks he gets in the preseason, if that's something where they're going to think about. Quarterback playing the NFL is pretty bad right now. If you give him some extended looks, would a team be interested in trading for him and, and giving him a shot as a starter? So he'll probably have another year in Cincinnati, and then halfway through his contract, you start to think about, if you're the Bengals, can you move this guy and get a value for him? You, you think they will move him? I mean, if, if he plays as well as, you know, if what we saw in that, that you know limited action in seven games, if that's what he can do, long term, then yeah, I, I think you have to because he was a low draft pick. So your return on investment would be pretty big if you can move him for, you know, even if you get a third round pick, you drafted him in the fifth round, that's a pretty good return. It is NFL Draft Scout on the Twitter account, at NFL Draft Scout, Matt Miller right now. BleacherReport.com is the website. I invite people to go there, take a look at all the uh, different mock drafts, the projections. We're talking about the Alabama guys. Matt, as always, thanks so much for your time. Hope you have a great afternoon. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it.